All right, so I'm getting DMs from friends of mine, online friends, asking, what is up with your little rants? So, <laughs> I was pissed. I'm still pissed, but I mean, I'm not like some nut job. We're going to talk about this. We are going to go through Trump's speech, long speech, and then uh, that's going to be this video, and then the next video is going to be, we're just going to cover some issues of why gun grabbing threatens people who don't own guns. Yes, it does. I don't even own a gun. That's right. I don't even own a gun. But I'll tell you what. I want people to own guns because you see here, you see how it says being necessary to the security of a free state. That's what it says. Let's go over and get a load of Trump. Open fire on a crowded downtown street. He murdered nine people, including his own sister, and injured 27 others. The First Lady and I join all Americans in praying and grieving for the victims, their families, and the survivors. I don't have any problem yet. We will stand by their side forever. We will never forget. These barbaric slaughters are an assault upon our communities, an attack upon our nation, and a crime against all of humanity. I'm still good. We are outraged and sickened by this monstrous evil, the cruelty, the hatred, the malice, the bloodshed, and the terror. Our hearts are shattered for every family whose parents, children, husbands, and wives were ripped from their arms and their lives. And uh, at this point, I'm sitting there thinking, because the reason why I went to watch the speech, actually, is because uh, the amazing Lucas put up a video saying this speech was terrifying. So I'm watching the speech, and at this one minute mark, I'm still, I think this is about where the first, like, what is about to drop. But anyway, um, I'm watching the speech, and at this point, I'm fine. Nothing wrong with what Trump said so far. America weeps for the fallen. We are a loving nation, and our children are entitled to grow up in a just, peaceful, and loving society. Together, we lock arms to shoulder the grief. We ask God in heaven to ease the anguish of those who suffer, and we vow to act with urgent resolve. So, act with urgent resolve is like where I'm first starting to go, okay, this might be where it's going bad. This might be why Lucas created that video. But up till, up till that, I'm good with everything. I'm good with, like, saying that we care about the families and so on. Because, I mean, duh, you know, this was a tragic act. It was an unfortunate act. I'm not some crazy person who thinks that people should be slaughtered. I just... Anyway, let's continue. I want to thank the many law enforcement personnel who responded to these atrocities with the extraordinary grace and courage of American heroes. I have spoken with Texas Governor Greg Abbott and Ohio Governor Mike DeWine, as well as Mayor DeMargo of El Paso, Texas, and Mayor Nan Whaley of Dayton, Ohio, to express our profound sadness and unfailing support. Good with all that. Good with all that. I have no problem with any of that. That seems, you know, run-of-the-mill, appropriate, you know, talk to the mayors, talk to the governors. I have no problem with that. Today, we also send the condolences of our nation to President Obrador of Mexico and all the people of Mexico for the loss of their citizens in the El Paso shooting. Honestly, just starting to make a little bit of a face here when I was watching it because I'm annoyed. 
you know, I mean, I think it should be pointed out that those were Mexican nationals and, you know, they were living here and that's immigration's kind of supposed to be Trump's thing, but you know, a tragedy happened. Okay. I can let that go. No problem. Let's keep going. Terrible, terrible thing. I have also been in close contact with Attorney General Barr and FBI Director Ray. Federal authorities are on the ground, and I have directed them to provide any and all assistance required, whatever is needed. Still fine. Sounds pretty, you know, normal. The shooter in El Paso posted a manifesto online consumed by racist hate. In one voice, our nation must condemn racism, bigotry, and white supremacy. These sinister ideologies must be defeated. I don't really have a problem with this, but one thing is I did read the manifesto. The guy never says he's a racist. Um, Anomaly pointed this out. He, or that he's a white supremacist. He talks about, he never says that he's white, I'm sorry. He never says that he's white, but he does say he doesn't like what race mixing. And that he doesn't like the invasion of Mexicans. So, but then, it kind of seems like he probably is white. Um, Anomaly said tossed out the possibility that he could also be Jewish, and some Jewish people don't consider themselves white. As somebody who converted to Judaism, obviously, like, I'm still white. So I never thought of Jews as non-whites before I converted, so, um, anyway. I mean, so far, the speech is still fine. You can see that we're at 2 minutes and 45 seconds. It gets really dicey around 5 minutes, but you know, I think there may be, we're going to go through the whole thing. Hate has no place in America. Hatred warps the mind, ravages the heart, and devours the soul. We have asked the FBI to identify all further resources they need to investigate and disrupt hate crimes and domestic terrorism, whatever they need. Okay, we're getting dicey. Isn't this the same FBI that weaponized itself against you and half of the country? I mean, I guess this is still standard, though. Still not that bad. We must recognize that the Internet has provided a dangerous avenue to radicalize disturbed minds and perform demented acts. Okay, so what? You gonna shut down the internet, President Trump? Now we're in dicey territory. We must shine light on the dark recesses of the internet and stop mass murders before they start. The internet, likewise, is used for human trafficking, illegal drug distribution, and so many other heinous crimes. The perils of the internet and social media cannot be ignored, and they will not be ignored. See, right here, this this is where I start to go, you know, with the side eye, looking at the computer, watching the video with the side eye. Because we're starting to get into, like, he's hinting at dystopian censorship at this point. I understand, like, the dark recesses of the internet, blah, 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 blah. I always try to explain to people, because, like, as you all know, I'm an Orthodox Jew. I'm in a pretty, not that religious, but I'm in a religious enough community that you you have a lot of people at this point use the internet. But especially like five, ten years ago, you had a lot of people in our community who would not get online. Or they would get online, but they would only do email. They wouldn't use Facebook. And I tried to explain these various things to people like the internet or Facebook or Twitter, or, um, I mean, like any social media, you know, um, email, the internet in general, I think I said that already. All of these things are tools, just like a 
G-U-N is a tool, just like a knife is a tool, just like a car is a tool. All of these things are tools. Tools can be used for good or bad. You can use Facebook to connect with someone from high school when you're like a middle-aged old fart. Or you can use Facebook to spread malicious gossip. Like I said, it's a tool. It can be used for good or bad. Social, me social media in general. Um, you know, you can use social media to connect with people and create positivity in the world and promote positivity in the world. Or you can use the internet for... Um, you know, like he said, human trafficking and all that sort of thing. And then there's, you know, people in the middle who just use it for like regular run of mill things that are neither good nor bad. The internet is a tool. Social media, it's a tool. Same thing with the GUN. It can be used for harm as it was in these three, no, two incidences, I'm sorry. Uh, the Dayton and the El Paso incident, or it can be used for for good. I don't know if y'all remember, but there was an incident in Texas early November of 2017. I remember exactly when it was that it was right before the election in 2017 because I was out campaigning to for for a campaign. Uh, I was out campaigning for a candidate who was running for mayor here. So that was our mayoral election that year. So I was out campaigning for that and the girl that I was with checked her cell phone and told me about it. And so that's how I very distinctly remember what time of year. It was a, the Sunday before election day. So the first Sunday in November in 2017, um, whatever that date was. Anyway, so there was a that that particular shooting was dropped from the mainstream media didn't fit the narrative because next door to that church in that small town was a guy who legally had a gun and he ran out he grabbed his AR-15 this was Texas so you know I think it was just leaning against the wall or whatever he grabbed it and he ran I think he ran out without even shoes or socks if I'm not mistaken I know he was interviewed by Steven Crowder of Louder with Crowder and he ran out and he ran after the shooter and I think he ran into somebody else was going after the shooter and he like ran in the back jumped into the back of their pickup truck and they were able to like take this guy down or whatever you know a good guy with a gun stopped a bad guy with a gun the more you take those tools from people, the more it can only be used for bad purposes and the less it can be used for good purposes. So what's left? Oh, knives. So knives, there was an incident. Um, I think it happened recently. I saw it on... It, shot into my Twitter timeline. Tommy Laren did a video about it where there was a guy who like knifed some people to death. And it was somebody who had been put in jail and who was let out way too early. They had 14 charges, originally given four years for 14 charges. Yeah. That's already pretty crazy. And then they gave him like all this time off for time served and this and that and well behaved and went to church or the mosque or whatever while you were in. And so you get time off for this and time off for that. And so he only ended up serving two years and he got out and he started doing bad things again. So knives can be used for evil purposes, but after I make this video, I am about to sit down to some garam masala sweet chicken with pineapples and carrots and potatoes. And so I'm going to be using a fork and a knife to dive on into that. 
So, like I said, knives are a tool. Knives can be used for good and they can be used for bad. Social media is a tool. Internet is a tool. Cars are a tool. What about that guy from, what is it, Sayo Saipoff or something like that? Uh, from downtown Manhattan who like ran over people on a foot, on a foot, on a sidewalk. Or all these people that like ran over people in London and ran over people in, in, uh, I wanted to say Facebook. France! Not Facebook. I think. Um, so a car can be used for good purposes. It can be used to get from place to place. Or it can be used for malicious purposes. It can be used to run people over. Alright. That was quite a bit of a side rant. But we're going to go back to the video because it's starting to get really bad and juicy. In the two decades since Columbine, our nation has watched with rising horror and dread as one mass shooting has followed another over and over again, decade after decade. We can that, since I last paused my long side notes, all of that was fine. We cannot allow ourselves to feel powerless. We can and will stop this evil contagion. In that task, we must honor the sacred memory of those we have lost by acting as one people. Open wounds cannot heal if we are divided. Uh, I'm a little worried about us acting as one people because, you know, especially since Trump veers into this, like, gun-grabbing anti-constitution bit after this, and it actually is more terrifying than that. People don't, didn't even notice some of the stuff he said, but, I mean, it still sounds like you know, normal, I mean, like, nothing here has been, it's all been, like, foreshadowing, you know, nothing here has been, like, particularly wretched yet. So we're at four and a half minutes or so. Divided. We must seek real bipartisan solutions. We have to do that. And it's funny how he choked on the word bipartisan. I really hate the word bipartisan because bipartisan normally means that the right is giving into the left and the left is running the show. And that's not, I already, I had com kind of concluded that, but that was how Tom Fitton of Judicial Watch worded it. He said, oh, but he was doing a video and he was like, oh, by the way, when they say bipartisan, that means the left is running the show. And he, he is not wrong, let me tell you. Every time I hear that, that's what I see going on. In a bipartisan manner that will truly make America safer and better for all. First, we must do a better job of identifying and acting. Okay, and this is where he starts to get into dark territory. Um, safer. I, I do want to stop and, and hone in on that a teeny bit because, um, okay, what, what makes us safer? I mean, if you look at it right now, the... I'm not, I'm not even going to talk. Let's, let's just go by the, like, excuse me, sorry, <laughs> what they cover in the news media. How, how many people have died according to, like, if you follow the stuff that hits the media? A couple hundred? Hundred a year? A couple hundred a year? Two hundred a year? Three hundred a year? There are 300 uh, estimates of how many people live in this country are between 300 million and 380 million. There are at least 300 million people who live in this country. And, you know, you hear these news stories... And I can understand people probably start to think, oh my gosh, can I go to the mall? Can I, can I, can I go to the Walmart? But I just want to point out that's how many people out of how many people in this country? People die, more people die from knives than die from guns. 
Also, most people who die from gun violence, it's usually, like, gangs. Um, they also count suicides as gun deaths. And there's still more deaths. Um, in particular from rifles, there's actually very few deaths from rifles. Most of the gang violence is, uh, hand, handguns. So, getting into, like, brass tacks. The thing is, people get really emotional. They don't, they don't really look at statistics and, you know, people say, oh, I sound cold or whatever because I'm just, well, I don't really go out that often anyway because... I'm just not somebody who... I don't like people. <laughs> I mean, I'm not crazy or anything, but... I... <sighs> anyway, I just... I don't particularly enjoy being in large, crowded areas. And most of the stuff happens in really, really crowded areas. It also happens in gun-free zones. Which is exactly why we shouldn't infringe on the Second Amendment. Exactly why. I would feel safer with less gun control. You want to talk about what makes people feel safe? I would feel safer with less gun control. I would feel safer if I had a concealed carry permit for myself and a gun. So that I would potentially be able to save other people if something happened and I was around. But... That's very expensive in New York, and I've never bothered to apply for it because it's expensive. And so, for all of you who might be getting your undies in a bunch, or who might have some wild-ass idea of reporting me to someone, I don't have any guns. I'm broke. Can't afford the fees to apply for one. And they're next to impossible to get here in New York City. Even, not even a concealed carry permit, even just to get a permit to get a gun that you want to take to the range to practice, even that is expensive. And you have to, like, keep it in a lockbox and all of this. I, like, looked into it and I was just like, wow, this is... And then I was, I was actually on a stream, I think it was on this channel, maybe it was on his channel, uh, The Right Conservative. We were on a stream together and I was telling him all of this stuff and he like looked it up. And he's from Florida, so he was just like, wow, I can't ever live in New York. <laughs> That's insane. But you know, if Trump gets his way from this speech, people in Florida might lose the Second Amendment too. So this is why I was saying... Hashtag Ted Cruz 2020 saying, hey, let's get Ted Cruz to primary Trump because his speech gets very, very terrifying right about now. Let's get going. On early warning signs, I am directing the Department of Justice to work in partnership with local, state, and federal agencies as well as social media companies to develop tools that can detect mass shooters before they strike. All right. There we go. Now, now, now we're getting into some pretty terrifying stuff. FBI, DOJ. I guess we're, I mean, even the DOJ, it's still mostly plugged up with Bush's and Obama's people. The FBI mostly plugged up with Bush and Obama people. I mean, they've cleaned cleaned it a little bit, but still pretty bad. Plus, if you start putting this stuff into place, as people have pointed out, what happens after Trump's in office and the left puts their terrifyingly leftist communist people into place. Yeah. Also, didn't he just have a social media summit he had a social media summit where he said, I'm going to get the social media off your neck. I'm going to get the jackboot of social media off you guys' necks. And then two shooting ha shootings happen and literally Trump caves and all of a sudden he's like, yes, I'm going to team up with the left, the left that's been attacking me for two and a half, going on three years. I mean, because what, um, 
Actually, yeah, I would say three years because he was running three years ago. Actually, four years. He started running in twenty summer of 2015, right? Yes. So if he started running in 2015, literally right after he ran, they were like, okay, we gotta impeach him. Especially after they thought he might get the nomination. So for four years, all of the left, the media, basically all of these people on the left have been attacking Trump. And now he wants those people to all team up with each other. And he wants to give them the power to go after people that are mostly, I mean, most people who legally have a gun who do not have malicious intent are Republicans. Yes, there is a rise in Antifa people getting guns, but for the most part, I mean, also, who does all the malicious reporting? Uh, conservatives, if they own a gun, they own it, they use it to practice. Maybe they do hunting. Maybe they do target practice. Um, I mean, some people even, like, I've heard they have, like, laser attachments. Like, light laser attachments where you can practice on a target. I think you can, like, hook it up to an app and then, like, you put your phone there and you, like, shoot your phone. Except you're not shooting bullets. You're shooting, like, a laser that attaches to your, um... I mean, I don't have a gun, so I don't know. I haven't really looked in this too in depth, but I believe that's what they, one of the things they have on the market. So people can practice like drawing and shooting right away and stuff like that um, and do this within their house. So that's one way that people practice. They, they put, they don't have any ammo in and they just practice like drawing very quickly and trying to like, you know, a very quick scenario where something happens and you're just like ready to go. Because if you don't practice that stuff when it happens, you're busy like basically shitting your pants. So, <clears throat> but people, you know, as with anything, you practice, you know, you practice, like if you're in a play, you practice your lines on stage so that when there's an audience there, you're a little bit more relaxed because at the very least, You've taken some of the work, you know, um, you're less nervous, you know, giving a presentation, doing a play, whatever. You practice so that you are less nervous when you have to, you know, when it's time to go. Um, I actually was discussing this with someone earlier today because we were talking about poetry. It was um, the Jeopardy, Final Jeopardy category was poetry. And the woman that I was with, who we were, her TV was on, and um, she was saying, she, I was in the other room, and then I came in her room, and she was like, oh yeah, the, uh, I knew the Final Jeopardy question, because it was a poem that I had memorized, and I was like, oh yes, I only know two poems, and I told her about how I competed in high school, um, for poem reading, and then the other one was I had to memorize a poem when I was in the army. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from soul to soul, I think whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In a fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced or cried aloud. Anyway, um, so, but then in high school, I did a competition for poetry in Spanish and so my teacher made me stay after school and practice and so the poem that I like read in the competition I practiced it so much I didn't have it exactly memorized but like I started to have bits and pieces of it memorized and so I was definitely able to look up a lot and engage in the audience and be way more relaxed and somebody else had the same poem and they went before me, and so I was completely relaxed, whereas if I hadn't been so well prepared, I probably would have been very nervous um, that this person had done the same poem. But I was way more relaxed than they were because I knew my stuff. So same as with people practice with the GUN in various facets, drawing it, you know, 
target shooting and all of that. People even take classes where, like, they'll have somebody run up on you and you, like, use a dummy gun and you, like, you know, have to, like, fake shoot them and stuff and, you know, to practice the element of surprise and stuff like that. So anyway, um, and, and military kind of practice like that. I mean, even basic training. So we had to practice and practice this is important when you want to be able to do something potentially under pressure. All right, I'm going on a long tangent. Let's get back to it. As an example, the monster in the Parkland High School in Florida had many red flags against him, and yet nobody took decisive action. Nobody did anything. Why not? Second. Why not is because the left was in charge of that. He was in some program under the left where basically he gets to keep acting up and he never gets in trouble and this is so the school could brag that they had like a better rate of you know criminal students so why not yeah that's why not why not is because the left allowed him to i mean also the cops didn't even go inside so bringing that up and acting like that is some sort of basis for going after law-abiding citizens. Very terrifying. And we must stop the glorification of violence in our society. This No problem, but how are you going to regulate that? I don't think we, I'm pretty sure we can't regulate that. But you want to talk about the glorification of violence, why don't you go after Hollyweird? We're not going to do that. You're about to say video games, aren't you, Trumpy Trumpy? This includes the gruesome and grisly video games that are now commonplace. It is too easy. They've been talking about video games since the 80s. Let's move on. Let's move on from this, like, craziness. In fact, it used to be, used to be the Christian conservative right that used to freak out about video games. And now it's not even because of the violence. The left... The feminist left freaks out about the video game because um, they objectify women in them. So I, I remember when I was in high school, I even I used to have a video game that I would play. And when I would like shoot certain stuff, I would get like women like moaning in very, uh, I don't want to demonstrate, but you get the idea. Women making sounds that would make men enjoy the game today for troubled youth to surround themselves with a culture that celebrates violence. We must stop or substantially reduce this, and it has to begin immediately. How are you going to do that, though, when we literally have, um, we're supposed to have a free society? I mean, on the one hand, I would love to see culture and society change in these manners, but how do you or any government entity have the power to stop that? I think the only way that can be stopped is if the people themselves backlash against these things. And I don't see that happening. I don't see parents. I mean, you know, you look at what happened in the 80s. They had all these, like, idiot women psychologists with no kids. Who would write a book and get on these talk shows don't spank your kid and then after don't spank your kid became the norm and you know people could call child protected services on you for it um if they somehow found out then it moved on to don't put your kid in a foreigner i mean basically it turned into don't punish your kids in any way shape or form so now we have i mean you look at and people in my generation, I mean, and that's the thing is, I don't have kids. Their response to me is always, well, you don't know anything because you don't have kids. But I'll tell you this. When I misbehaved, my mother spanked me or she took, she took stuff from me. I mean, we didn't have, I didn't play video games. Not really. Not, not the video game I was just talking about recently. Um, I had that when I was 18 and my mother was already deceased. So, um, but I mean, no TV, no phone, um, you know, 
when I was 17, 18, you know, my dad, no car, no borrowing the car because you did something wrong, you know, no, you know, no going out with your friends, no hanging on the phone. This was before cell phones, but in general, people still, you know, they would take things from kids. You know, you're grounded, you have to stay home. That was, I don't know if they still call it grounded. My generation, they called it grounded. It meant you had to stay home. You weren't allowed to go hang out with your friends. Um, you weren't, you know, generally it meant no TV. Sometimes you could be grounded but still be allowed TV. Um, very few people had computers when I was growing up. Um, when I was a teenager, computers were starting to come around. So, like, some people, it meant no computer but generally, like, take the stuff that you like and you're supposed to, like, come home from school and do your homework and this and that because you screwed up in some way. And then the left said we weren't allowed to do that either. So, um, my estranged sister, back when her daughter, who is now 23 years old, back when she was, like, four or five years old, my sister didn't even want to make her clean her room. Now, well, there's been a few incidences where if my sister and I were on speaking terms, I'd be like, told you so, told you so. Okay, she kind of ran up the credit card. I never really got too many details about that, but I did kind of find out through the grapevine that she ran up a credit card and my sister and her husband were pretty livid about that. These are the kinds of things that happen when, you know, you don't make your kids clean their room at four years old. I mean, it's little things like that. You don't give in. You know, I see people where, like, they tell, like, when I would babysit. Perfect example. Somebody would tell me, okay, they're not allowed to have junk food. They're only allowed to have, like, apples or something. They have to have a healthy snack. And they would start grabbing at the ice cream and, you know, the chocolate and other things that were categorized as the non-healthy snack. And then these parents would come home and the kid would be having a fit and they'd be like, what's wrong? What's wrong? And it's like, you know, probably the other babysitters weren't actually adhering to the rules. But, you know, that's the thing is, you know, you can't give in just because your kid throws a fit. And people used to consider this common knowledge, and I think people still understand this, but in practice, people don't practice this. I see all the time where people, my generation, they basically say, you don't understand, you don't have kids, when you have kids, you love your kids. And this is a societal problem. It started with um, my generation, they changed marketing, and so, they allowed marketing companies to market just to the children and the marketing companies basically targeted advertisements so that kids would nag, nag, and nag their parents to get what they wanted. And so it changed the approach of parenting. And so from my age, who as children really, really wanted stuff because of how children were not protected against marketing from like my age on. So from my age on, people grew up, these kids grew up with the mindset that, you know, that's when children started to manipulate their parents. If you really loved me, you would buy me this, buy me that. And of course this is ridiculous, and I think even people who do this probably understand that it's ridiculous, but at the same time, they'll turn to somebody like me who does not have kids and they'll say, you don't understand, you don't have kids. I love my kids, therefore I buy them crap that they don't need. Of course they don't call it crap that they don't need, but they insert some example, example after example, of crap that their kid really does not need. You know, your 10 year old does not need a phone. They just don't. They, they, they should be waiting until they get a phone. They should have to wait until they're old enough to pay for it. They should have to have a job to pay for it. 
you know, I mean, and this stems into also, um, I was recently posting this on Twitter, I think it was, and it's not just like secular kids. My, I, I don't, I'm not really on speaking terms with her anymore. <laughs> my landlady when I very first moved into this apartment I went to the park with her and her kids who were at that point much younger they're now like high school college age but anyway the time they were much younger and the ice cream truck came around and they wanted some and I said just you know I told her just tell them no and she's like well their teacher told me I shouldn't say no to them. And I'm just like, this This is where like the rot in society comes. And it comes from like, say, teachers who, and a lot of these teachers, I know most of the teachers in the Jewish schools are married with kids, but a lot of these teachers and psychologists and psychiatrists, they either don't have kids or the other thing is they have young kids and so they probably haven't seen the malicious effects yet, but they just decided that this was the best way for people to raise kids. And it sounds like a tangent, but all of that causes children to grow up to be adults who basically are still children. And you see it with, you know, the Antifa kids throwing a temper tantrum because they don't like who was elected president. Well, there are also these kids grow up and they don't, you know, something doesn't happen. Something happens in society where it isn't what they want. And so they want to, in some way, shape or form, throw a fit. You know, whether they throw a fit because they throw themselves, literally throw themselves on the ground like a three-year-old. Yeah, we've all seen the clip with the woman in the bright green jacket where she's like crying as Trump is getting inaugurated. They always say it's after he got elected. It wasn't when he got elected. It was outside of the inauguration. This woman like flipped out. Anyway, we've all seen that clip. We've all seen basically Antifa, who, you know, in the entire left, who's basically had a temper tantrum since November of 2016 because their girl lost and the other guy won. They've been throwing a fit. Literally throwing a fit like a child. I mean, you also have, if you look up Jonathan Haidt, at some point I'm going to do a video on Jonathan Haidt. He wrote, he's a college professor who wrote a book about the coddling of the youth or something like that. And he talks about how from 2014 on, they started seeing college kids with the shout downs. You know, um, that's where you had that girl who like yelled at a professor because his wife wrote some op-ed in the college paper about how people should be able to wear whatever Halloween costume they want. When in fact what she wanted was for people to be able to, um, the, oh the girl that was throwing the fit that shouted down the, the male professor, the female professor. The female, his wife was also, I believe, a professor. Like, it was a, a husband and wife professor team where they were both professors there. And the wife professor wrote this article. I believe it was in the student paper. And so the student basically threw a temper tantrum. It's not fair. I don't feel safe if you wear a costume I don't like. And, and you know, cultural appropriation, like, like, you know, she doesn't feel safe if you wear a costume that she doesn't like. And when you talk about it like that, it really sounds fairly ridiculous. But we've continued to give in to this in society. Really not sufficiently, not enough speaking out against this has happened. All of this stuff, this is like the rot in society. And there's another video I'm going to, well, I'm going to put this in a playlist. And I'm actually going to link that video into... I'm going to put that video in the playlist as well. So um, there was a video from Larry Sharp who ran for governor as a libertarian in New York State. And I actually campaigned for him. Um, so he ran 2018 midterms. Anyway, he's still around and he's doing commentary and 
going out and doing speaking engagements. He did a video reacting to the shooting and it was a very good video because he basically acknowledged that people feel emotional but he explained that all of this like gun grabber nonsense it's not gonna fix it and he told an example of how he had ants in his house and instead of spraying for the ants he had to go out back and basically pull a bunch of weeds that you know he had gotten lazy on and not taken care of and so you know, he said, you have to fix the rot in society. And I don't, you can't fix this stuff easily. You can't fix this stuff with, you know, just this law or that law or an executive order. All of this stuff, it's, it's culture wide. And it's been intentional from the left who ironically is pushing for the gun control and gun grabbing. I mean, even... Trump basically caved to the left. I'm very upset that he caved to the left. I'm not happy about that. I'm feeling a little better because of the stuff that came out um, with immigration today. I'm glad he's finally doing something. Because, I mean, it was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back that I said after Donald Trump. Because... We haven't gotten a wall. I did not expect, you know, when the left is like, oh, you expected a wall. No, I, I didn't expect a whole wall, but I expected the wall to be started sooner than this. And I realized, and, and I've been giving him a pass because I've understood that he's been fighting the left, but then it's just been thing after thing after thing where he's been fighting the left and you know and he's also been caving and i also understand he doesn't really have anybody who has his back he has a handful of congress people he has a handful of senators and he also still has the rhinos so he's not just fighting that he doesn't have i'm saying that that he's fighting so he doesn't just have to fight the left he has to fight all these rhinos who are presumably on the right but they're on the left that's why they're rhinos Republican in name only. Like Dan Crenshaw. Let me call out Dan Crenshaw. Who also came out on Twitter come, come, coming at everybody for gun grabbing. And then, to make matters worse, when he got horribly ratioed and terrible pushback, which he should have, rightfully so, in his comments, he came out and he doubled down. He doubled down on his leftism. He doubled down on his anti-constitutionalism. And he had the nerve to say that people want the, cons the Constitution, freedom, and liberty upheld. He had the nerve to say that we were the ones acting emotional. No. Actually, no. Actually, we're the ones not acting emotional. We're the ones who are looking at the statistics and going, okay, 30 people out of... 360 million or so people, that's a pretty small proportion. Yes, it's scary. But when push comes to shove, the amount of people getting shot versus the amount of people that exist in this country who did not get shot on the weekend, it's a very small percentage. Very, very small percentage of people that that happened to. I think, I wonder if the uh, statistics for getting struck by lightning or winning the lottery are better. I mean, maybe not. But but the thing is, people hear it, hear about it in the media, the media covers it, and therefore, in their mind, it's bigger than it actually is. And I know that this video is insanely long at this point, but apparently that's what's needed. All right, let me get back to this video. Cultural change is hard. But each of us can choose to build a culture that celebrates the inherent worth and dignity of every human life. That's what we Yeah, and the right has been trying to do that. The left has been pushing against valuing life. We have to do. Third, we must reform our mental health laws to better identify mentally disturbed individuals who may commit acts of violence and make sure those people not only get treatment, but when necessary, involuntary confinement. What? What? What?
Mental illness and hatred pulls the trigger, not the Oops. gun. Fourth, we must make sure that those judged to pose a grave risk to public pulls the trigger, not the gun. Involuntary confinement. Mental illness and hatred confinement. Mental illness necessary involuntary confinement. 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 Mental do you understand yet? Do you understand why I was quite freaked out? I mean, not that I'm particularly mentally ill, but that is horrifyingly dystopian. And it's like, did nobody hear that line? Cause, cause I heard that line. Those two words freaked me out. Because it's the thing, it's not even just the, the gun grabbing. It's not just the gun grabbing. It's, it's throwing it out there that if necessary, you're going to involuntary confinement. It, it, I mean, he doesn't say if he's going to put them in jail or if he's going to lock them up in the booby hatch, but either way. That sounds pretty terrifying to me. Somebody who didn't do anything. Someone else accuses them. And they're going to lose their freedom for that. What happened to due process? What happened to presumption of innocence? All gone. And that's already what's happening with red flag laws that exist now. Um... I mean, not involuntary confinement, but with the existing, they're still going to people's houses at crazy hours. I watched a video yesterday that, surprisingly, YouTube put it in my suggestions, but it was a story of from 2018, from like a year and a half ago, Um, this pro-Second Amendment channel, one of his uh, subscribers wrote to him. I'll link, I'll put this also in the playlist. I'm going to change the name of the playlist. I'm going to use the same playlist before that used to be called Donald Trump. I'm going to change the name of that to uh, gun grabbing is bad or something like that. I don't know. Um, but in that playlist, the guy's kid had a classmate who overheard something, told his mom, who was a total nosy bee body, busybody, who called the school, and the school took it upon themselves to contact the police or the FBI or whatever, who showed up at this guy's house and basically, based on I believe all the kids said was like, your security sucks or something like that. Um, it might have been more involved in that, but I mean, I don't think it was like, oh, I'm going to take a gun and I'm going to shoot you guys. It was just, you know, like maybe, maybe saying like teachers should have guns or something like that. I believe the discussion, I'll link the video. You can hear, you can hear from there. He reads the video, reads the letter from the guy. But either way, what was going on is a kid said something to his classmate and the whole thing. I recently did a video. I did a video. Uh, school overreach, where I, like, made it appear like the school had arms coming out of it in my thumbnail for it. And it was about um, a kid who, like, he had his pictures on Snapchat or something... This, this is like, we're already experiencing this kind of like dystopian overreach of organizations and institutions like your children's public school. And like I said, I, I told you the story. My landlady's kids were in a Jewish school and yet the teacher was telling her how to raise her kids. And people think teachers are the experts or something. Yeah, experts that the the left has basically involved in 
you know, teaching teachers and so on and so forth and determining the mindset of teachers. So even if your kid's in private school, you think, oh, I'm going to send my kids, unless, and unless you're homeschooling your kid, if, you know, you send your kids to private schools and they still can get leftists for teachers. Even a Jewish school, most Orthodox Jews, something like 70% of Orthodox Jews voted for Trump. Vote Republican. And it's getting higher because I've seen, um, I mean, anecdotal, but I've been seeing some outspoken Democrats who are like, because of the Ilhan Omar stuff, they've come over. You know, or at least they're questioning if they still want to be on the other side. All right, I gotta keep getting through this. This is incredibly long. Illness and hatred pulls the trigger, not the gun. Fourth, we- That line is fine. Mental illness pulls the trigger, not the gun. That line is actually fine. We must make sure that those judged to pose a grave risk to public safety do not have access to firearms and that if they do, those firearms can be taken through rapid due process. That is why- AKA gun grabbing. Why I have called for red flag laws, also known as- Also known as gun grabbing. Extreme risk protection orders. Today- In other words, gun grabbing. I'm also directing the Department of Justice to propose legislation ensuring that those who commit hate crimes and mass murders face the death penalty and that this capital punishment be delivered quickly, decisively. I, I'm actually okay with that. I, I think pretty much anybody who commits more than one murder or, or murder rape, I think all of those people should potentially, but I don't understand, like if you're a gangbanger and you shoot up the rival gang, you get out in two years, but, but, you know, if, if, uh, if you're, you know, if you, if you shoot up people at a mall, then you get the death penalty. I mean, it seems a little uneven to me. I think pretty much most murderers, anybody who like actually gets convicted of a murder, I would say murder plus any other, like, high-end felony like two murders or a murder on a rape you know any kind of like serial killer i don't think those people should get life in prison i'm i'm all for them getting capital punishment but i think it's really really uneven that trump recently signed the first step act that they bragged was going to get black people out of jail and I am not for uneven um, distribution of justice. I believe that if you do the crime, it should not matter what color your skin is. It shouldn't be like, I mean, I guess previously black people complain that like black people would go to jail for stuff and white people would get off. But it doesn't make it better if all of a sudden the reverse is true. Like black people can and, and illegals and Hispanics can murder people. <clears throat> Kate Steinle, that guy got off. So um, here in New York City, we have our mayor basically put it out there that um, if you're illegal, you're allowed to be a drunk driver. Drunk driving is allowed for illegal people. They are not, al the police are not allowed to arrest someone who is illegal for drunk driving. But someone who is not illegal would go to jail for drunk driving. So I'm not for this uneven distribution of justice. But I'm totally for murderers and especially those who have murdered multiple people. Um, I believe a mass mass shooting is qualified as four people or more, but they tend to, uh, they make it about like these, cr you know, crazy person snaps and shoots people. Meanwhile, a gangbanger 
who shoots up just as many people of a rival gang. There was, the shootings, there were almost as many people who died in Chicago this past weekend from gang violence. And that was just, I mean, it was a little bit less, but not that much. I think it was like, what, 40 or 50 from these two shootings? And, and I think it was like 30 people who died in Chicago this past weekend. I mean, that's, that's a normal weekend. You know, in gang infested areas in this country, you have hordes and hordes of people who die every weekend, weeknights, weekend nights, broad daylight, drive by shootings. And this stuff does not get covered except for on the local news. And I am not for this uneven distribution of justice where a gangbanger shoots up 10 people of a rival gang and, and some even some innocent people in the crossfire, you know, in a drive-by shooting. And, you know, I mean, and supposedly the left is supposedly for, you know, black lives. But, I mean, I heard so many stories because, of course, we have a lot of this stuff that goes on in New York City, drive-by shootings, and you have um, casualties. And it definitely hits the news. You'll hear it hit the news there'll be a casualty where, you know, some grandma was walking into a bodega at the same time the gangbanger was walking into the bodega and the grandma was like holding the little three-year-old grandchild and three-year-old gets shot and killed, but they were like trying to shoot the gangbangers. And this stuff never makes national news. Never. Never makes national news. This stuff happens all the time. All the time in bad areas. Let's get back to it. ...and without years of needless delay. These are just a few of the areas of cooperation that we can pursue. I am open and ready to listen and discuss all ideas that will actually work and make a very big difference. Republicans and... My, meanwhile, you're talking about stuff that's not going to actually work. Democrats have proven that we can join together in a bipartisan fashion to address this plague. No, you can't. No, you can't. Democrats and Republicans don't work together, like I said before. Bipartisan and working together means the left is running the show. Last year, we enacted the Stop School Violence and Fix Nix Acts into law providing grants to improve school safety and strengthening critical background checks for firearm purchases. At my direction, the Department of Justice banned bump stocks. Last year, we prosecuted a record number of firearms offenses. But there is so much more that we have to do. Now is the time to set destructive. Now is the time. Now and farewell to your garden, to your freedom, to your liberty. And as we pause, partisanship aside, so destructive, and find the courage to answer hatred with unity, devotion, and love. Our future is in our control. Answering hatred with unity and love is fine, except that I know that the left is incapable of that. America will rise to the challenge. We will always have, and we always will, win. The choice is ours, and ours We do not win with this speech, President Trump. ...alone. It is not up to mentally ill monsters. It is up to us. If we are able to pass great legislation, after all of these years, we will ensure that those who were attacked will not have died in vain. May God. Nope. All right, that's it. I've been commenting through the whole thing. Um, yeah, actually, I'll go ahead and. So we have here the text, a meme that I created. One of the things I want to emphasize, if you're still with me, super long video, I know. B 
being necessary to the security of a free state. Everybody always, you know, you always see the meme where shall not be infringed is in red. And I chose to do, put this one together where instead being necessary to the security of a free state was in red. I chose to put that together because... I want to emphasize that even if you don't have a gun, even if you don't want to have a gun, I don't have a gun. I don't have a gun. I don't, I don't actually, well, I probably would have a gun if I lived in a different state, but, um, can't afford one. Don't want to go through the hassle of getting one in New York state, but, um, don't have a gun, but I want other people to have the right to have a gun because I understand being necessary to the security of a free state. It's a hedge against tyranny. I want you to understand that phrase, both of those phrases, because they always say, shall not be infringed, shall not be infringed. Being necessary to the security of a free state. Without this right, we are not free. Understand that. Understand that loud and clear. It's it and like I said, it's a hedge against tyranny. That's the phrase that my teacher actually used. Eighth grade teacher, social studies actually taught us that you always. She said, "This is a female teacher, not a male teacher." She always she said, "You always vote for candidates that are pro Second Amendment, even if you don't want to have a gun." And explained to us that people having a gun, it's a hedge against tyranny. She explained to us. That in history, what they always do before, like, they majorly put the jackboot down on their citizens or, shall I say, subjects, as we are about to become, they take the guns. In Germany, they took the guns. And then what did they do? They shipped the Jews off. They shipped the Jews off to the concentration camps. When did they do that? After they took the guns. This is a very terrifying meme that uh, somebody put up on my Discord server. It says, read this slowly and think about it. Then read it again and help it sink in. Obozo said, we're sending assault weapons to rebels in Syria to confront a regime that does not represent them. Then Obozo says, there is no reason why any American should own assault weapons. I don't know, maybe because uh, our government doesn't necessarily represent us. I mean, I can tell you my congresswoman does not represent me. I actually met her um, less than a week ago. And I didn't say anything because I didn't really know what to say. I wasn't prepared for it. wasn't expecting her to be at the event that I went to. But she was there. The only thing I would have said was, by the way, I can't stand you. But, um, you know, typical leftist on all the leftist committees. And unfortunately, I mean, we have this big faction of Orthodox Jews who do not stand for and do are not interested in the sorts of things that she votes for and talks about on Twitter. And people ask me, like, I explain to people where she stands on stuff. And people ask me, like, how do you know what she voted for? How do you know where she stands on this issue? And it's like, look at her Twitter. What was I saying earlier about, um, you know, social media as a tool? It's a great way to find out what your representatives think and what issues they are, you know, honing in on. You can't, I don't, sometimes it's hard to find their voting record. But a lot of times when, like, something horrendous goes up, like when I heard that the Equality Act passed Congress, I wanted to see if my congresswoman had, uh, had voted for it. And uh, I don't live in Ocrazio's district. I live in the neighboring district. So I have a run-of-the-mill congresswoman that pretty much unless you live in her district or you're super super political you're not gonna know her name i think even most people who are fairly political would not know her name probably the other congress people know her name that's about it but um 
for the most part, I don't think people know her name unless you live in my district. But she's head of some leftist committees or vice, vice chair of a leftist committee. And she stands for things that go against the Orthodox Jewish religious belief. And I actually went out into the neighborhood at one point, into the heart of the Orthodox Jewish neighborhood here in Queens. And I spoke to some people on the street and I told them how she felt and asked people if it was a problem. And some people said they, they considered it a problem, but no one was willing to do anything. They weren't even willing to educate others. Just a simple thing to just, you know, okay, I'm going to go home and I'm going to email five people and tell them about this. I'm going to get on the phone and I'm going to tell five people in this neighborhood about this. I'm going to, you know, 10 people. I'm going to, I'm going to tell a handful of people about what's going on. I could not even find people willing to do that. See the left. When you want to talk about an issue like that and you want the left and the left is out recruiting other leftists to talk about these things, they get on board and we have to start getting on board because they do and they're taking away our country. You know, there's, um, there's actually a song, country Western song, um, take our country back. And in the comments, you get these snarky leftists who are like, take your back country back from who, you stupid white supremacist. And it's like, from the left. And, you know, it's not a racial issue. I mean, there there are non-white conservatives. And there's actually a lot of non-whites who are conservative and they're voting Democrat because they don't really understand. Like, I was talking to this kid on the bus today, a college kid. I asked him, are you, are you in high school or college? He's, um, he said it was uh, second year of college. And I asked him, uh, I said, so did you escape the high schools teaching you that there's more than two genders? And he said, oh, no, I didn't escape it. He said, they tried. I said, so they taught you that. And he said, well, they tried. And he kind of giggled or gave it a little laugh. You know, but I bet he goes and votes Democrat because he doesn't understand. He doesn't understand the connection. That's what we have to do. Just get out there and make that connection. Plant seeds. Talk to people about things like it's crazy that people think you can change your gender. It's crazy that people think that there's more than two genders. And in here in New York City, there actually is legally more than two genders. There's legally... 31 recognized genders in New York City. Legally, they have to allow people to use whatever bathroom they want. Where I live, that's already the case. In leftist areas, this is like legally, this is the law already. Uh, Blair White made a video where she went in, she actually went in the men's room. I say she. She, she he, she, he, she, he. Can't decide. <laughs> She looks like a she. She's still got a wee wee. So does that make her a he? I don't know he. <laughs> anyway. Blair White made a video where um, the individual used the bathroom matching the gender to which this person was born into. Which, you know, they still have the equipment for down downstairs and um but on the outside this person looks like a very convincing woman if you don't know who Blair White is um conservative commenter more, more anti-SJW than straight up conservative but um yeah and they told her they asked her to leave which I think I was like anyway I brought this up because I was like but I know they can't do that in New York City, so I'm surprised they can do I'm willing to bet they can't legally do that in San Francisco. No, she lives in L.A. But still, I'm sure L.A. is still, I mean, pretty left-leaning. Like, San Francisco and Portland are, like, the worst, and then behind them are, like, New York City and, and L.A. and a few other places. 
All right, this video is hugely long, hugely long, but since people got all berserk at my rant video, that was a little more, you know, I'm still pissed. Of course I'm pissed. I'm, I'm pissed. I don't, I don't know if I'm going to vote for Trump. It doesn't really matter. I live in New York state. So if I don't vote for him, I mean, I'll probably, I, I'm thinking about maybe voting libertarian, depending on who runs on the libertarian ticket. I'm a big fan of trying to break up the whole bipartisan thing anyway. I really don't actually like that we have a two party system in this country. And I feel like it would help if we had more parties, like major parties. So Libertarian Party is probably the party that has the best potential to rise up. There's been a few states that have had Libertarian governors. So I think you'd have to see more Libertarians in office before it'd be realistic to get a Libertarian for president. But I feel like it makes a great protest vote. And like I said, I live in New York State, so my state is going to carry Democrat. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's, I was surprised when, like, Pennsylvania flipped, but, like, New York State is, it's just not going to flip. So, it's just not going to. Um, I think maybe our percentages might be better this round. Because I do feel like a lot of people are coming around. But a lot of it depends. I mean, people in New York State don't really care that much about gun rights. I mean, even up upstate, maybe a little bit. But people in New York City, even people who are conservative, they don't really care about gun rights. Because it's very onerous to own a gun here. But there's a reason why I chose this thumbnail. And if you, you know, let's look at this again. Why does gun grabbing threaten people who don't own guns? And you see that I highlighted being necessary to the security of a free state. They don't make that connection. See, I make that connection. When you talk about taking people's guns, I don't even have a gun. But to me, I hear we're going to implement communism or some other form of like big government. I, I hear we want to put the jackboot down on the citizens and turn you guys into subjects. I mean, we're already partway there. But I guess a lot of other people in New York, in New York City in particular, a lot of boomers on my Facebook, they don't make the same connection. They don't, you know, to them, that's not really their conservative issue. Their conservative issues... Um, I would say the main conservative issue that people in New York City care about, um, I mean, not for Jews, but pro-life and a lot of anti-leftism, you know, um, there's a lot of people who've gone conservative because, because of the left putting the men in the ladies room and because of the left putting a wow I'm over an hour <laughs> I'm at like an hour and 20 minutes now <laughs> which you can see but anyway um so I guess I'm gonna put this up as a long version and then I'll also create a short version so um but uh it's very it's very important to make the connection we have to teach people the understanding being necessary to the security of a free state. I understand everybody's like, shall I be infringed? Shall I be infringed? No, no, no. Being necessary to the security of a free state. That's why it matters. Even if you don't have a gun yourself, even if you don't want a gun yourself, that's why it matters. It matters whether or not people can have them because if other people can't have them it means we don't live in a free country being necessary to the security of a free state hedge against tyranny all right this video has gone on more than long enough oh, well.
need to be awake. Maybe things are stuck in my chin. I need to be aware. Maybe stand up against the sun. I will see you next time. Oh, well, people need to be awake. People need to be awake. They need to be aware. They need to stand up against this stuff. Oh, well, and it's so politically engaged.